Good afternoon. I'm Craig Nodain, Senior Vice President with SAIC and the Vice Chair for Government and Public Affairs for the Chamber. It is my pleasure to introduce this next session focused on Redstone's role in research, evaluation, testing, and modernization. When you peel back the layers of Redstone to find what makes us so unique, you'll find engineers, scientists, and program managers developing and testing weapon systems for tomorrow's military. Our next session will take a deeper look into these organizations, the Aviation and Missile Center, the Future Vertical Lift CFT, the Positioning, Navigation, and Timing CFT, and the Redstone Test Center. I'll introduce all the speakers for this session now, and they will follow each other. First up will be Dr. Juanita Christensen, the Executive Director of the U.S. Army's Combat Capabilities Development Command Aviation and Missile Center. The Aviation Missile Center comprises approximately 12,000 military and civilian professional scientific support personnel and manage a combined mission reimbursable customer funded budget of approximately $3.9 billion annually. The director manages the aviation and missile plans and executes technical research and engineering programs and demonstrations. For example, research exploratory development, advanced concept technology demonstrations, and field support engineering functions of the center. As director, she provides support to both missile and aviation commodities in such areas as product assurance, software engineering, system engineering, production, test, and evaluation management and business management. As top civilian authority and scientific and engineering expert on research and development for the aviation and missiles in the command, she exercises direct line authority over all activities to assure adequacy of budgeting, planning, conduct, and effectiveness of programs and a balanced and competent technical capability. Dr. Christensen joined the MRDEC in 2012 after leadership positions with PEO Aviation and SMDC. Prior to that, she worked in the private sector with SDI, CAS, General Dynamics, and Boeing. She received her Doctorate of Management and Organizational Leadership from the University of Phoenix, her MS in Computer Resources and Information Systems Management, Webster University, and her BS Computer Engineering from the University of Illinois. She has received numerous awards and citations for her good work, all of which are listed in the online bio. Next up will be Brigadier General Walter Rugen, the director of the Future Vertical Lift Cross-Functional Team. Two years ago, the Army created the Army's Future Command to accelerate the modernization of six of the Army's highest priority platforms and efforts. Rather than duplicating existing capabilities, the Futures Command created cross-functional teams at various existing centers of excellence. And one of those is the Future Vertical Lift uh, CFT, and that cross-functional team is located here at Redstone. Brigadier General Walter Rugen was born and raised in Onalaska, Wisconsin, and was commissioned through the United States Military Academy, West Point, in 1989. He is an Army aviator and joined the one Cephas Special Operations Aviation Regiment where he served as an MH-60K platoon leader. He later deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom and Operation Enduring Freedom and has also served a couple tours in Korea as well as in the Pentagon. His many awards are included in the online bio. Next up will be Ms. Jerry Manley, the Deputy Director of the Assured Positioning, Navigation, and Timing Cross-Functional Team. For those of you unfamiliar with PNT, it is the science that makes GPS and other key military technologies work. Ms. Manley was selected for the Deputy Director position in April 2019. In this position, she is responsible for developing PNT, navigation warfare, and space capabilities to enable Army forces to reduce reliance on global positioning systems and penetrate enemy anti-access area denial systems. She leads a team of 25 military and civilians and contractor CFT char uh, staff charged with synchronizing PNT modernization efforts across the Army. She previously worked with the U.S. Army Space and Missile Defense Command, Army Forces Strategic Command, U uh, USSMDC RSTRAT, in various technical roles supporting PNT capabilities for the Army and is a voting member for the Department of Defense Space Experimentation Review Board. She has also worked at the Missile Defense Agency in various technical positions. Ms. Manley earned a BS degree from Athens State University. 
Wrapping up this session will be Colonel Stephen R. Bradham, the commander of Redstone Test Center. <clears throat> Colonel Bradham was born in Columbus, Ohio, and was commissioned from West Point as a second lieutenant in the aviation branch. He has held a variety of operational assignments in aviation in Korea, Bosnia, and Iraq. Colonel Bradham received his Bachelor of Science degree in Mechanical Engineering from West Point in 1993 and a Master's of Science degree in Aeronautics and Astronautics from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2002. After, gradu at, after graduate school, he served as an assistant professor in the Department of Civil and Mechanical Engineering at the United States Military Academy. Colonel Bradham completed the U.S. Naval Test Pilot School as a distinguished graduate from Class 128 in 2005, and he completed the Program Manager's course in 2011. Colonel Bradham was selected as the National Defense Industrial Association's U.S. Army Military Tester of the Year in 2009. Colonel Bradham served in a numerous uh, number of acquisition assignments. His military awards are listed in the online bio. So now here's Dr. Christensen to get us all started. Good afternoon, I am Dr. Juanita M. Christensen, the Executive Director at the U.S. Army Combat Capabilities Development Command Aviation and Missile Center. I know, long words, but we'll just call it AVMIC for today. Thank you so much for having me uh, at the chamber here today. I truly enjoy always having an opportunity to share what we do for Redstone Arsenal and the Army at large. So we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you. Next. So what, what do we do uh, behind the gate? At Aviation and Missile Center, we are part laboratory and part engineering services. And our primary focus is to develop and explore new technologies and also provide those life cycle engineering services to our primary PEO aviation and PEO customers. So our job is to provide that foundational engineering base for aviation and missile systems. Next. So by the numbers, always, it's always good for me to provide to you who we are behind the, the, the fence, but also to let you know from a, from a funding and personnel perspective who we are. We are one of the larger uh, in employers behind the gate for the Army, and we have approximately 12,000 employees per our strength. Now this is across our entire Aviation and Missile Center. And, and in a later chart, I'll tell you specifically how many of those are actually behind the gate. But our funding, we always want to give insight as to what we do and what the funding that we bring to the Redstone community. And our FY19 funding was right at $3.8 billion. And you can see that that's made up of our support to the Army at large, as well as Aviation s and Missile s and and then other uh, reimbursable customers that we also support in our mission space. Next. Locations. Many of you all know that we are headquartered here at Redstone Arsenal, but what some of you all who don't know is that we also have four other remote locations where we support. Uh, on the aviation front, uh, our office out at NASA Ames Moffett Field, as well as our joint, joint base Langley Eustis, Virginia location on the East Coast. And then Colorado Springs, we do a lot of support there for the Missile Defense Agency. And then down at Corpus Christi, Texas, we are supporting the Army Depot that's located there. Next. But our Redstone Arsenal footprint, that's why we're here. It's all about the community, our relationships with our partners, with our partners that are here and across the arsenal. So for FY19, actually we had approximately just over 8,000 Redstone Arsenal personnel here working behind the gate. Now, given the fact that we've just come out of, or still in COVID, we do have a very minor footprint now uh, with only about just over 15, almost 1,600 employees that are coming behind the gate on a day-to-day -day basis due to COVID. But we are still here to support the mission and to support the needs of the Army. So from a facilities perspective, again, we're one of the larger uh, tenants of Redstone Arsenal with over 238 buildings behind the gate. 
the only other facility, only other organization that is actually larger than us, and that's in land mass, and that would be the Redstone Test community. So we are a very large provider behind the gate for the Redstone Arsenal and the community at large. All right, next. So many of you all were wanting to know, what are we doing right now? What are some of the, the, the near-term accomplishments that we've been able to do? Well, one of the things that was a highlight of this year for our commanding general at the Army Futures Command, uh, General John Murray, was Project Convergence. It was held in 2020, it was held in the September timeframe, and there were five efforts related to convergence, what they were trying to prove out. And that was to compete, to penetrate, to, to disintegrate, exploit, and then recompete. So Project Convergence was really intended to bring more of the technologies to bear across the entire Army research uh, construct, enterprise, and bring those together and exercise a, a, a very large experiment called Project Convergence. Our own General Murray said we have to learn from the technology demonstrations how we're going to have to change how we fight and how we organize for that future fight. So we, as the AVMIC, were able to participate in Project Convergence uh, just over a month ago. Next. So what does that mean for AVMIC and what we brought to the table? Primarily, we were supporting uh, that convergence from our future vertical lift activities, specifically in four uh, primary areas. Air launched effects, uh, and that really is about looking at delivery of unmanned aircraft systems to bring about a lethal and non-lethal air launched effects. So it allows you to actually penetrate further into the cross-domain space and then to exploit and then expand the maneuverability to provide an overmatch capability. So that was one of the things that we were looking for and doing as a part of air launched effects. So future attack reconnaissance aircraft, FARA, you know, everything for the Army is always an acronym. So it's really looking at what that future aircraft will be incorporating as we go forward to support long range munitions, air launched effects, and other modular architectures. If you look at the third block, that's future long range assault aircraft, FLORA. It is what will be the future advanced agile high speed vertical lift transport aircraft. That is what what will we bring to the table for the future? And then the last piece of Project Convergence and what we were looking at is also called Tactical Intelligence Targeting, or TITAN. It's looking at scalable and expeditionary intelligence ground stations, uh, leveraging space and high altitude aerial and transfer um, uh, techniques such that we can bring more data to the FIRES network. So that is what we, uh, as an AVMIC organization, brought forward for Project Convergence. Next. So air launched effects, so a little bit. I've talked a little bit about what it was purposed for. Again, it's for the UAS delivery of lethal and non-lethal air launched effects. Why is that important? Because this allows us to expand through penetration the the capability of a manned platform by keeping that manned platform in at safe distances. Now he can launch these, you, these unmanned aircraft systems, air launched effects, and then produce lethal and or non-lethal effects. So it just expands, it penetrates us out into further, uh, further uh, space and environments, and just really looking forward to um, bringing that capability. So as a part of PC-20, we launched over 62 ALE flights, and it was just a, an amazing and, uh, accomplishment of our team with over 138 flight hours achieved. Uh, we also were able to simulate, excuse me, we were able to simulate uh, autonomous uh, handling of teaming as well as landing of some of those systems. So very successful program, very successful uh, engagements as a part of that experimentation. 
So what we what I brought for you today is a video showing an actual launching of one of our unmanned aircraft systems providing uh, that air launched effects and it's actually being launched off of a Black Hawk. So the capability in itself is truly a force multiplier because, again, it keeps that manned aircraft out of, out of uh, safe distance but also allows that air launched effect unit to go forward and penetrate uh, at extended ranges and then to exploit and expand maneuverability uh, for uh, providing an overmatch capability. All right, next please. All right. So what we talked about before was where we are, what have we recently done, but really part of, of, of having this engagement with the chamber and our local business partners is to let you understand where we are and where we're going for the future. So many of you all know that we are part of the Army Futures Command and they have a modernization strategy identified by six major s and priorities. The two of which that we lead from Redstone Arsenal are the future vertical lift as well as the air and missile defense capability. However, we also, in addition to that, we also support long range precision fires. So that is why that is identified because we have a number of projects that we are executing in that space. But our primary focus is really in the exploitation and the modernization and the technology advancements relative to future vertical lift and air and missile defense. Next, please. So the future, where are we going? Uh, this is really beneficial so that you understand, yes, what, not just what priorities we're doing, but what are the key tasks that we're gonna be taking forward in the, in the next few years. So really our priorities, again, are to execute the aviation and missile s and projects. Uh, and we do that in partnership with the CFTs and many of you all know what those are. Those are our cross-functional teams. So there is a cross-functional team identified with each one of those priorities. Here at Redstone, uh, the, the Future Vertical Lift CST, CFT is actually housed underneath uh, Redstone Arsenal and they are housed here uh, within the AMCOM footprint. So the other part is to continue supporting the Army modernization efforts. We do that via a specific, de very deliberate partnerships and collaborations with our, our enterprise partners, PEO Aviation, PEO Missiles in Space, RICTO, SMDC, the SCO, MDA, and other services. But I want to pause here with RICTO. A lot of what we've talked about is what we've done in the aviation and missiles and space world. But we also have a very unique partnership with the Rapid Capabilities, com I'm sorry, Rapid Combat Capabilities Technology Office. We are leading their, uh, their strategy relative to hypersonics and we are supporting their thermal protection system as well as providing them engineering support for their new mid-course range capability. So again, we are not just supporting our customers today, but we are poised to support the future. So, and then of course, continue to provide readiness, life cycle engineering, and sustainment support across the entire Army enterprise. So we do that with AMCOM as well as our PEOs. So, but what are the key tasks that we're gonna be doing over the next two years, from January 21 through March of 22? FVL, in the FVL footprint, we are going to be supporting project convergence with additional demonstrations for our RISTA capability, uh, additional technologies for uh, air launched effects, verifying our modular open systems architecture for the FLOR program, and then transitioning um, relevant tool sets to the FAR competitive prototyping program efforts to PEO aviation. In the long range precision fires, what are we doing? We're doing uh, land-based anti-ship missile seeker technologies, development in support of the PRISM spiral capability for um, PEO missiles in space. 
we are, again, supporting the hypersonics S&T implementation plan. Many, many things that we have that are targeted for the future of our systems. Uh, assured uh, Precision Navigation and Training, APNT. We're doing an integration relative to uh, missile uh, engagement opportunities. So we're doing that. And then the air and missile defense, we are bringing forward maneuverable air defense technologies, uh, acronym MAD-T, as well as control test vehicle flight testing and in support of integrated air and missile defense testing. And then the last priority that we're also supporting is next generation combat vehicle. And what we're doing for them is what will be their next close combat missile. We will be looking at development and test efforts in support of that. So those are our priorities that we're going to be focusing on for the future. So we are poised and present to support the Army today as well as its future priorities. Next chart. That's all that I have for you. Please see our, um, our contact information, our website, visit us on Facebook, send us a Twitter. I don't tweet, but please do if you'd like to. Our public affairs office is also located on this chart. Thank you. Hey, hello to the uh, Huntsville Chamber of Commerce. It's, uh, it's great to be with you virtually. Uh, again, my name is Brigadier General Wally Rugen, and I'm the director of the Future Vertical Lift Cross-Functional Team. Um, sure wish we could be with you in person. Uh, really appreciate the venues you provide. Uh, but uh, again, with the pandemic, uh, everyone's being safe. And I think uh, everyone would agree that's the smart and wise decision. First off, I'd like to thank uh, my team. Uh, my team uh, lives and, and uh, shares your community with you, and they've been doing a tremendous job in keeping all of our programs and initiatives uh, on schedule during this pandemic and, and really going above and beyond. So, uh, you know, I'd really like to thank the, the cross-functional team for all the tremendous hard work they've done in keeping us on schedule and on budget. Um, Secondly, I'd like to thank our teammates uh, here on the uh, arsenal, uh, both PEOs, PEO Aviation and PEO Missiles in Space are doing tremendous work for us. Obviously, Aviation and Missile Center uh, are, are tremendous partners uh, in uh, pushing the limits of technology and getting the capabilities we need for our, our future formations and soldiers of tomorrow. And so I want to uh, thank those uh, great teammates. And then lastly, obviously, thanks to the community and all the great support you uh, have given us uh, as we've, you know, started off here as the new kid on the block uh, on Redstone Arsenal and in Huntsville. Uh, just to report out uh, on our four signature lines of effort, uh, the future attack reconnaissance aircraft. Uh, again, we did the down select in March from five to two. Uh, the two performers, Lockheed Martin Sikorsky and Bell, uh, are working on their final designs. Those final designs will be into us uh, within the week or so, and will take uh, about a month from the Army to uh, to work those final designs and do a readiness review here in December. So on track, even with the the, the uh, pandemic, we're still looking at our uh, future attack reconnaissance competitive prototype flying. Uh, in November of 2022, and again, uh, we feel like and assess that we've maintained schedule through the pandemic, which you know was was difficult, but it goes after why 
uh, I kicked off this uh, video with thanking my team and my, uh, my partners. I think when we talk about future attack reconnaissance aircraft, uh, the next thing I would like to hit is, is our Project Convergence 20. Uh, when Project Convergence 20 was uh, compared to the Louisiana maneuvers that the U.S. Army did prior to World War II, uh, that was a very apt and uh, accurate comparison. Um, we went out to uh, Yuma Proving Ground uh, in the heat and really fought our architecture, fought a, a number of our uh, lethality and uh, electronic warfare payloads in the heat, in the dirt, with real uh, air vehicles, uh, with a real ground force, and uh, with a real fires community. And uh, proud to say that uh, we learned a lot, but we also showed most importantly the efficacy of our uh, kill chains and what we're working to provide a, a force that's very lethal, very capable in the future. We'll continue with those uh, exercises, experiments, and demonstrations for the coming years and be happy to report out uh, how we're doing on those uh, exercises and experiments. The future long-range assault aircraft remains on schedule. Uh, we're in the midst of uh, a competitive demo and risk reduction phase, uh, both phase one. Next year we'll uh, enter into phase two. Um, we're looking forward to dropping a, a draft request for a proposal next month uh, and then um, actually publishing the request for a proposal um, in the late spring, early summer of uh, next calendar year. Uh, again, we maintain our schedule with the future long-range assault aircraft. And what may be new to the chamber is uh, the Army submitted a budget uh, to Congress for the uh, FY21 appropriation that instantiates a four-year acceleration on the future long-range assault aircraft. And so we're proud of the uh, accomplishments of that program. Uh, we look forward to uh, accelerating that uh, left four years, uh, assuming Congress supports that acceleration. Next, with our future UAS, uh, obviously it always starts off with our air-launched effects or our, our small drones that we launch from our rotorcraft. Uh, we took 56 uh, prototype air vehicles out to, to Yuma uh, in the aforementioned uh, Project Convergence 20 experiment and uh, we're able to really work those drones uh, out to distances that really transform uh, the battlefield ge geometry for our core and division commanders. Um, a lot of folks in the Army and across the Joint Force are very excited about um, our air launched effect or drone work. And what I would tell you too is uh, you probably saw in August where the, the program manager for unmanned aircraft systems uh, awarded 10 uh, OTA contracts in this space uh, for the air vehicle, for the mission system uh, architecture, and also for payloads. The Army is moving out on air launched effects and again, uh, very decisive in our experimentation, brought some very unique and um, powerful capabilities. I think additionally, when we look at our air launched effects, uh, the ability to recover, and what we saw too is uh, being able to fly them out and not have to uh, belly land them and, and basically do a controlled crash uh, was really something that the team from Aviation and Missile Center uh, here, our partners, uh, on Huntsville uh, and on the arsenal were able to uh, pull off in uh, well ahead of schedule. Our future tactical UAS uh, program is, is finishing up. Uh, again, we selected four air vehicles to do a buy, try, and inform. Uh, the inform is to inform our requirements. This is uh, informing the shadow replacement aircraft. Uh, and again, we, we took this out to five uh, Army Brigade combat teams. Those Brigade combat teams uh, flew the aircraft uh, both at home station and then at combat training uh, centers, uh, be it the National Training Center or the Joint Readiness Training Center, and uh, really shook the, uh, the platforms out and are giving us tremendous feedback. You know, here uh, 
at the FBL CFT, but also in Futures Command writ large, we really view soldier touch points uh, as crucially important to informing our requirements. We don't want to build things that uh, the soldiers uh, don't uh, have any input in and don't uh, appreciate and don't want. And so uh, seeing this touch point, probably the signature touch point in the FEL CFT uh, finish up here in the coming month uh, is again, a tremendous accomplishment for the team, especially during uh, this pandemic where uh, both PMUAS uh, folks from Fort Rucker, Alabama, our partners down there, and the CFT uh, were still able to, with mitigation, get this uh, effort uh, kicked off and completed. Lastly, uh, I would like to talk about our modular open system approach. Uh, again, uh, my silly anecdote on this is we want an Android phone where uh, all uh, coders can write an app for that, uh, and that's what we want our rotorcraft to be. Uh, we want that to be open, a government-defined interface, a government-defined standard uh, that ensures that we don't get vendor lock and ensures that we can upgrade at the pace of technology. Um, the uh, architecture control working group being run out of PEO Aviation uh, with all uh, partners in there from the government and industry has really proven to be a great venue to work through the issues associated with our modular open system approach. And again, all the offerings we've seen both in uh, FARA, Future Attack Reconnaissance Aircraft, and FLARA have uh, achieved uh, to a degree our goals in uh, modular open system approach and we need to keep it up. Uh, again, uh, as we look into next year uh, and coming out of um, you know, the pandemic, and maintaining momentum, uh, we will see um, a lot happening across all four lines of effort. But uh, make no mistake, what we're really uh, building these capabilities for is transformational capability to the aviator and to the ground force. And that transformational capability gets into the speed, range, and endurance that's more than double our current platforms. It gets into the survivability that we achieve and we're seeing achieved with uh, entering into the digital design environment and getting out of uh, the industrial age where our current fleet was designed and built. And then uh, getting after affordability. Uh, the affordability aspect is, is not uh, uh, inconsequential, we have to be affordable within the Army Aviation budget and we continue to achieve our affordability goals as we've built uh, a very lean program and a cost conscious culture. Um, pursuing that thread a, a bit more, you know, we've had a lot of outside agencies look at uh, the affordability of our programs to include the Congressional Budget Office, uh, the C Center for Strategic and International Studies, and uh, we'll also get the Congressional uh, um, Research Service to, uh, to conduct another study. Again, we want to make sure that we are affordable and uh, stay within our budget. Uh, it's important that we get the transformational capability, but we buy to budget. And uh, that is uh, always on our mind, and we're mindful of that. Um, again, we've gotten great uh, support from uh, the community writ large here on the Arsenal. Great support from Huntsville as, again, one of the newer uh, partners here in your community. Truly appreciated. And if any of you, uh, you know, wish to have more questions answered, um, we here at uh, the CFT, we take every meeting. So please give us a call and uh, let us know if you have any concerns or how we can help or you can help us. And with that, uh, above the best. Uh, Army Aviation is, is that advantage for the Ground Force Commander, and we're going to build that for the next generation. Thank you very much, and we'll see you soon. Good afternoon. I'm Jerry Manley. Deputy Director of the Assured Positioning, Navigation and Timing Cross-Functional Team, or APNT CFT. And we are part of Army Futures Command, which is headquartered in Austin, Texas. However, our cross-functional team is located here at Redstone Arsenal. 
I would like to begin this, this afternoon by thanking the Huntsville Chamber of Commerce, Redstone Arsenal, and the U.S. Army Material Command for hosting this year's Redstone Update. While this year's event may look very different than those hosted in years past, I am honored to have this opportunity to share all that the APNT CFT has accomplished this year, as well as share with you our plans for 2021. The APNT CFT is requirements focused, tasked to accelerate the delivery of requirements that are informed with continuous experimentation, prototyping, and soldier feedback. Our team works within three signature efforts depicted on this slide, APNT, Tactical Space and Navigation Warfare, to provide trusted capabilities that support soldier assured positioning, navigation, and timing. Soldiers are increasingly operating in conditions where access to GPS and PNT information is denied or degraded. Adversaries today are employing formations, capabilities, and concepts designed to deny use of the electromagnetic spectrum and limit freedom of maneuver in order to challenge our ability to compete in ground combat. The Army is working with our joint partners to develop Joint All Domain Command and Control, also known as the JADC2 concept, which will complement the Army's multi domain operations strategy. Keeping up with this new operating environment is the responsibility of the APNT CFT. It is our job to build an advanced PNT capability and enhance GPS for Army forces with minimal impact to soldier operations. The APNT CFT budget in FY20 was $385 million. Of that amount, $45 million was spent here in the greater Huntsville area, with five government agencies receiving $13 million and $32 million that was distributed among seven industry partners. In FY20, the CFT awarded two other transaction authorities for development of sensor-to-shooter capabilities totaling $170 million. One of those OTAs is focused on prototyping space signature and sensor-to-shooter campaign of learning capabilities, and the other is focused on our annual pos positioning, navigation, and timing assessment exercise called PENTAX. In October, one of our partner organizations awarded a $24 million contract for the Mounted Assured PNT System, or MAPS, that is expected to create approximately 50 jobs distributed across three states. The CFT also plans to announce award of a space OTA in FY21, totaling $30 million, which is focused on the integration and analysis of existing space-based capabilities and platforms. The APNC CFT had a very successful year in 2020. As previously mentioned, the Army awarded the MAPS OTA through the C5 Consortium, which includes maturation of the MAPS Gen 2 solution and begins combat platform integration in preparation for initial production. The development of MAPS Gen 2 is proof of our mission to accelerate the development of modernized soldier capabilities. This award was announced less than a year after the first generation of MAPS was equipped in Europe and less than a month after the MAPS requirement was approved. MAPS was the first ever PNT requirement for the Army. Additionally, the CFT has initiated a sensor to shooter campaign of learning, which will add new and existing space-based technologies to enhance soldier access to targeting. Working closely with our mission partners, we are enhancing our ability to deliver a space-based capability to provide deep sensing, which can be tasked at the strategic, operational, and tactical level to produce prompt, accurate, and persistent data to enable precision fires at range. In February and March of this year, the APNT CFT partnered with U.S. Army Europe and successfully conducted a series of live fire exercises, demonstrations conducted in Grafenfeer, Germany. 
The live fire exercise consisted of three demonstration events, during which the team successfully sensed and engaged targets at ranges beyond line of sight, using satellite capabilities that have not been responsive to ground forces until now. As the Long Range Precision Fires cross-functional team begins to field artillery equipment with firing ranges greater than previously capable, the APNT CFT, along with our mission partners, will integrate these new capabilities to enable accurate, reliable, and timely engagement of the long-range threat. In September of this year, the Army Futures Command hosted Project Convergence at the Yuma Proving Ground in Arizona. During the Project Convergence live exercise, the APNT CFT successfully demonstrated the Army's ability to sense and engage targets at ranges beyond line of sight as part of the JADC2 concept. At this point, I would like to pause and show you a quick video which illustrates our sensor to shooter campaign of learning. As technology continues to advance at a rapid rate, the battle across domains is evolving as well. Advanced technologies such as machine learning and AI can help. They have the ability to drastically change the way soldiers operate in the battlefield, reducing response time, simplifying or expanding cognitive processes, and enabling faster decision making. In this heightened environment, space is quickly emerging as the new frontier in the future of warfare. The domain is high-paced and contested. U.S. military forces and coalition partners will be required to detect enemy targets from space to enable adversary engagement with greater speed, better accuracy, and at longer ranges from friendly forces to ensure overmatch. Deep or well-protected targets in anti-access and area denial regions pose significant challenges. It is imperative that the Army expand its ability to detect, identify, persistently track, and engage these targets quickly and efficiently. The Assured Positioning, Navigation, and Timing and the Long Range Precision Fire's cross-functional teams, in coordination with their mission partners, are enhancing the Army's sensor-to-shooter process to address these issues. Leveraging new and existing space-based capabilities, this enhanced sensor-to-shooter process can be employed across echelons to accelerate the speed of decisions, adversary detection, weapons delivery, and target assessment. It enables joint multinational interagency applications using an increasing number of sensors. Operational forces will be able to engage time-sensitive targets faster and further away by exploiting integrated multi-domain reconnaissance, surveillance, and target acquisition capabilities. This will shorten sensor-to-shooter timelines. In addition to sensing hostile targets, it can eliminate them as well, as high payoff targets are identified and geolocated by space-based sensors. ISR data is processed by the Army's Tactical Intelligence Targeting Access Node, the Army's Digital Fire Systems, Joint Automated Deep Operations Coordination System, and the Advanced Field Artillery Tactical Data System to prosecute enemy threat systems. This enables military forces to engage a target at distances previously outside of range, and enables friendly forces' freedom of maneuver. After engagement, space-based assets will perform battle damage assessments to ensure mission success. Sensor to shooter will enhance the Army's ability to engage targets quickly, effectively, and efficiently, as required for a next generation targeting process. It is a key part of the Army's multi domain operational strategy. The Assured Positioning, Navigation, and Timing, and Long Range Precision Fire's cross functional teams support the Army Futures Command in the Army Force's ability to deploy, fight, and win in any battlefield environment. In late November, early December, the Army Futures Command will host an industry roundtable event. During this event, the APNT CFT will share data with industry that was collected from the recent Project Convergence live exercise. This event will continue our coordination with industry and academia partners as we further develop advanced soldier systems and platforms. The CFT continues to develop the Army's sensor to shooter capability with plans to execute additional live fire exercises in FY21. We currently have a team deployed to White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico, executing our annual Pentax event, 
conducted to assess PNT capabilities operated by soldiers in a GPS challenged environment. Pentax informs requirements, validates and refines doctrinal concepts, and supports technical solutions to address capability gaps in Army warfighting technologies. The Army provides the Live Sky GPS challenged environment as well as soldiers to operate the prototype equipment. Government agencies, services, and industry partners are invited to participate with their prototype systems and to collect their own performance data. The best part about Pentax is the ability to involve the soldier during, the, during this prototyping phase. Soldier feedback influences future requirement development and enhances our ability to design and field future systems that will ultimately improve mission effectiveness. We are early into FY21 and already have a lot to look forward to. The CFT is finalizing the requirement for the Army's dismounted APNT system called DAPS, which will be submitted for approval in the second quarter. Additionally, approval of the tactical space and navigation warfare requirements is expected later in the first quarter. We will continue the sensor to shooter campaign of learning with live fire exercises scheduled later this year in Europe and the Pacific. And we will also host Pentax as part of Project Convergence 2021. As the APNT CFT looks to the busy year ahead, I hope you will continue to join us in developing innovative PNT and space-based technologies that will provide solutions for soldiers, both today and in the future. In closing, I would like to thank you again for allowing me this opportunity to share exciting APNT accomplishments and to participate in this year's Redstone Update. Thank you. So ladies and gentlemen, hello from the U.S. Army Redstone Test Center, also known as RTC. My name is Colonel Steve Bradham, and I'm the commander of the Redstone Test Center. And I'd just like to say how honored I am to have the opportunity to come to you today and to talk about what we do and who we are at at RTC. So I'm going to start by talking about our higher command. So we're a subordinate unit of the U.S. Army Test and Evaluation Command, or ATEC, which is headquartered out of Aberdeen, Maryland. Um, but RTC is a tenant organization on Redstone Arsenal, and we are the premier Army test center for the testing of aircraft, aircraft systems, missiles, and sensors. To talk about ATEC, so the Army Test and Evaluation Command, our parent organization, uh, provides direct support to Army Futures Command to support Army modernization, and conducts testing to provide Army senior leadership with the direct and independent um, critical information that they need to make timely and correct decisions about Army materiel, about the equipment that goes out to soldiers in the field. I and mean, we do that through developmental testing, operational testing, and evaluation. And I'll, I'll show you that here in just a second. So developmental testing is really the heart of what we do. And developmental testing is when you have a new item that's going to go out to soldiers in the field. The first thing you do is we have to do technical testing to determine whether or not it meets its requirements. Does it meet its specification? Does it do what it needs to do? and then what hazards are associated with its operation to make sure we can properly mitigate them before handing it off to soldiers. So you can see that in the upper left, and that's really what we, what we do. Operational testing is testing with soldiers in an operational environment, and we don't typically do that here. That's done by Operational Test Command as part of ATEC. But then not just at the beginning when we do developmental testing, but we also test through the entire life cycle of a system. So you can see down at the bottom of continuous, the, the banner there for continuous evaluation. And we do that, and a good example of that is what we do for stockpile reliability. So we go all over the world to look at the Army's missile stockpile for all different types of missiles uh, to do the testing that provides the, the statistical analysis to support extending shelf lives of systems and validating that those weapons in, in, in the stockpile um, are ready for use and will be able to function properly when needed by the warfighter. So the next slide shows you all the different constituent components of ATEC, all the different test centers, and there are many across the country. Um, White Sands, Aberdeen, uh, the Yuma Test Center, Electronic Proving Ground, which is in Fort Huachuca, Arizona, 
uh, ourselves, the Redstone Test Center there in the center at the bottom, and the West Desert Test Center out in Dugway Proving Grounds in Utah. But you can see each one of those test centers has its own specific role in the kinds of things it tests and the, uh, and the different systems that it works on. And so you can see that we are, of course, the premier test center for missiles, aircraft, and sensors. And then when it comes to Army modernization, RTC is the, is the primary test center in ATEC to support future vertical lift. We also support a number of the other CFTs in different ways, but we're the primary for future vertical lift. So before I talk about the Redstone Test Center, about RTC in detail, I want to show you a quick video that will give you a better idea of, of what we do. The U.S. Army Redstone Test Center is renowned for its expertise, state-of-the-art capabilities, and customer-oriented approach. As the Army's premier test service for aviation, missiles, and sensors, we work every day to ensure our soldiers get the best possible equipment by providing an optimum combination of test knowledge, systems expertise, and modern test capabilities. RTC's workforce contains over 1,000 employees spanning almost every engineering discipline. We're resourced to support a large number of customers and a high capacity of test workload. We have over 1.4 million square feet of facilities, over 13,000 acres of range space, and over 60 aircraft. At RTC, we believe testing should be done throughout a system's life cycle we provide capabilities to support programs literally from cradle to grave. Even before a system exists, RTC can provide modeling and simulation expertise to determine design requirements and analyze how new systems impact the fight. And once a system enters development, RTC has the capabilities to support testing with an extensive range of component test facilities. We provide unique lab, range, and aviation capabilities that can give prototype sensors and seekers their first view of the world. As components come together into subsystems, RTC provides the ability to expose them to realistic warfighting conditions through an extensive set of laboratories and hardware in the loop facilities, and through a vast comprehensive climatic, vibration, and electromagnetic environmental effects test capability. When it's time to prepare for live flight test, RTC provides the country's leading aircraft and missiles instrumentation expertise. We're ready to test, whether we're testing on our ranges and in our airspace, or we safari to another location. We'll turn the blades. We'll pull the trigger. We'll get the results. RTC's test services don't stop when a system enters production and sustainment. To support production acceptance and stockpile reliability, we develop custom test sets and perform surveillance testing all over the world. And we're here to support all future upgrades, whether it's software updates, product enhancements, or newly integrated systems. RTC prides itself as having the technical edge. Located in Rocket City and as a member of Team Redstone, we are infused with the leading edge ideas and capabilities. RTC is leaning forward today, defining how to test in the first purely man-made environment, cyber. Using live, virtual, constructive, distributed environments, we will test to ensure our warfighters get systems that perform in the net-centric battlefield. System of Systems testing will ensure our forces get the decisive advantage. Technical edge, expertise, service, and mission. 
RTC is dedicated to providing the safest and most effective weapon system possible to the American soldier. Okay, so that was a that was a great a great overview of what RTC is and what RTC does. Um, here's our mission. Clearly, we test again um, aircraft, aircraft systems, missiles, and sensors to provide Army senior leadership the information they need to make uh, to make good and timely decisions. Uh, this slide shows some of our capabilities. I'm going to talk about this just a little bit. So, aircraft test, one of our primary capabilities, and we do some of that testing here on the arsenal. We do some of that testing at other ranges uh, all over the country, and we do conduct uh, aircraft operations uh, here in the local area. And I think RTC has been here now for, for some time, and I think the community largely is used to seeing our aircraft come and go from Redstone. Um, I would just say every now and then we get questions about military aircraft, and I just to say there's, there's nothing to be concerned about. Military aircraft are operated by very experienced professionals who follow all of the Army, DOD, and FAA uh, requirements. As far as Army modernization goes, we're, there's some exciting times here in uh, looking at Army aircraft. And there's, in future vertical lift, um, two of the bigger programs, so the future attack reconnaissance aircraft, or FARA, and the future long-range assault aircraft, FLARA. Um, we're starting now to get ready for those test programs that will come down in, in a few years from now. Um, but so just recently, we had the first government uh, experimental test pilot uh, go out and fly the Raider, the Sikorsky Raider aircraft. Um, and I'm going to show you a, a quick video of Charlie Packard, our experimental test pilot, uh, flying that aircraft as he starts to build what is the combined test team that will work um, between us and the vendors to, uh, to do the developmental testing on, on not only Sikorsky's Raider X, which will be their FAR aircraft, as well as the Bell Invictus aircraft. And then we're also, for the, for the FLARA aircraft program, we're getting prepared, trying to lay the groundwork and build experience in these uh, new kinds of aircraft. And so you can see we just recently sent test pilots out to fly the Bell V-280 Valor in Texas. Uh, and later on this year, we'll be sending pilots out to fly the Sikorsky Boeing uh, SB-1 Defiant aircraft. So really, really exciting times uh, for, the things that we're, uh, for the things that we're testing. I'll point out, uh, going back to the, our capabilities, I'll point out uh, our missiles, uh, systems testing, and you know, frequently, I know we're not the only tenant on Redstone that makes noise, but we, we do make a fair amount of noise. Um, I can tell you that we take great care in looking at meteorology and looking at uh, when's the best time to conduct the detonations that we have to conduct, um, and we really appreciate the support we've received from the community in, uh, in allowing us to do the things that we need to do here to complete our mission. So, and then of course we do sensor and active protection system testing, uh, both for aircraft and for ground vehicles. Uh, there's a number of supporting capabilities that you see here on the bottom. Um, so for example, we have environmental tests. The Redstone Test Center operates facilities to conduct the complete, what we call mill standard 810 testing, to look at the complete environmental testing of an item. So not only for high temperature, low temperature, uh, high humidity, solar loading, wind, salt fog, all of those kind of regimes, but then also to look at uh, the dynamic, the vibratory environment. We have a unique six degree of freedom shaker table that allows us to put aircraft or put uh, components uh, through their vibratory life uh, very efficiently. We have um, just a broad range of capabilities, centrifuges, the ability to do rail impact testing, the ability to do drop testing, the ability to do insensitive munitions testing, which is to determine, um, to make sure that the, uh, the explosives that we use, that they only detonate uh, when they're supposed to detonate. So things like uh, cooking off ammunition, what happens if ammunition catch fire? Uh, what happens if they're hit by projectiles? Um, what happens uh, if they're hit by lightning? So we have a number of, of capabilities there, as well as the full capability for the electromagnetic environment. Moving over to instrumentation, instrumentation and the miniaturization of instrumentation is one of, our, one of our strong capabilities. We provide the instrumentation and telemetry for all of the Army's uh, missile testing, uh, everything from the 2.75 inch rocket all the way up to the current um, Hellfire and the Joint Air Ground Munition, the JAGM. Um, 
as well as providing flight termination systems that we have designed and manufactured um, for the Army's larger missile programs when they're operated on other, other, uh, other ranges. So, and then finally, modeling and simulation. We have a lot of capabilities for modeling and simulation for hardware in the loop for aircraft and for missiles, for seekers, for all kinds of, uh, uh, all kinds of component and system testing. So, and then I just would like to point out the size of our footprint. Again, we have about 1,300 people here, uh, government, military, and contractors working in the center. And we actually occupy about a third of Redstone Arsenal, about 17,000 acres. We have more than 350 buildings. Um, and you can see here on this, on this picture, you can see how we're, the orange kind of shows where we're located uh, on the arsenal. Um, and a number of, of test areas and a tremendous amount of capability for test. Tests that we use to support not only uh, we support all of the Army um, entities and programs. Uh, we also support other DOD services uh, with, their, uh, with their programs. We support other organizations like NASA and the Department of Justice and the FBI, some of their operations here, as well as private industry uh, when they have a test that requires our specialized equipment or expertise. So really a tremendous capability here. And I, I really just want to say, um, for, for you to take away just really how grateful we at the Redstone Test Center at RTC are for the support we get from the community and the support we get from all of our other partners in Team Redstone. So we're really honored to be able to support all of the other partners here from PEO Aviation to PEO IEWS, from MDA and NASA and the FBI to our commercial partners and, and all of the others. So it's an honor for us to be able to support the testing that validates these systems as they go into the hands of the warfighter. And we're really looking forward to continuing to do it into the future for, uh, for Army modernization. So with that, thank you from the Redstone Test Center and Truth in Testing.